the temple. Let's pray. Oh God, in reading this, it's so easy to think how foolish these Pharisees are in questioning the Most High. But Lord, who are we to think we're any better than them? For we once made mockery of your great name. We once to race against you, made war against you, did not honor you with our hearts or our lips. But yet anyways, Lord, despite our rebellion against you, you saved us. And you may reveal to us that you are the great I am. And Lord, I do pray that we would honor you this day. Pray, Lord, that you would help our brother James teach us the truth from your word. And Lord, as the word goes forth, it will grab hold of our hearts and our minds. Not just grab hold of it, Father, but give us understanding. Help us to meditate on that which is taught to us throughout the week. And Lord, as always, Lord, as we go throughout our week, help us to evangelize the people at our job and those whom you have predestined us to witness to, Lord, that we would witness them and that you would give them ears to hear so that your kingdom would grow, that you would bring all your elect in through the preaching of your word and the teaching of your word. And there's no other name to ask by which our prayers can be heard except in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, we close out this section of John today. And we need to keep in mind what we've learned thus far. Remember John 1, where the gospel writer, where the evangelist says that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him. I'm still away from Paul's teaching to the Colossians and for Him. And by him all things were made. Nothing that was made was not made except that he made it. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. We're seeing that in John 8. But all who did receive him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave the privilege. He called them his own. Not because of their will or the decision of their mind or their blood or their heritage, or their lineage, or their history, but by the will of God. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, glory as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. From Moses we receive the law, but from Jesus we receive grace upon grace upon grace. And we've seen this play out now, 74 sermons. I would say 74 hours is probably more like 86 hours. 74 sermons out of this text, and I can promise you that I've truncated it. Just in this very text in John, in John 8, I could teach about the Trinity. I could talk about death. I could talk about eternal life, contextually deriving from it. But we will see it as we continue to move in this gospel. We've seen Jesus call the first disciples. We've seen the miraculous power of His divine person, knowing the heart of man. We've seen Him turn water to wine, showing that He was the better bridegroom. And He did not even take credit for that, but gave His work, credit for His work, to the master of ceremonies and to the bridegroom. That's a gospel illusion. It points to and, for, and back and forth to the gospel. We see then in John 2 where John the Baptist even says, I'm not the Christ. Who are you? I'm the one that says, make straight the paths of the Lord. The one who has come after me is before me. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Why do you baptize? Well, I baptize with water. But the one who's come baptizes with fire and with the Holy Spirit. He cleanses the temple out of the prophecy of Malachi. He would have zeal for his father's house. And they like, by what authority do you do these things? He says, I tell you this, the truth. Destroy this temple and in three days I shall build it up again. Many believed in his name because of the signs and wonders that he did, but Jesus did not believe in them. Because he knew what was in man. And no one had to tell him what was in the heart of man. 
And there was a man named Nicodemus of the Pharisees who came to Jesus by night. And we see that. You must be born again, beloved. That is part of the gospel message. You must be born again. It's not just that you take truth to the knowledge of the text. You must be made alive by the Holy Spirit. No matter how much Bible knowledge we have, no matter how many centuries of tradition, of theological things that we know, like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, these are very intelligent people. They know the Bible more than you and I will ever know of the Bible, academically. But they were not born again. They were not born again. And the very people who called forth the coming of Messiah, rejected the Messiah every single moment that he gave proclamation of himself as God come to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. Messiah, the Christ. So Jesus goes to the Samaritans, <laughs> the accursed dogs of society, the traitors of Judaism, the inbred worthless Worthless, uncircumcised people. And Jesus saves the people of Sychar. When the people of Jerusalem rejected him. And then in John 5, Jesus says that you search the scriptures, O Pharisees. Because in them you think they have, that you find eternal life. You think that your knowledge brings you to God. You think that because you are Abraham, that you are God's chosen elect. But you are not, for you are not mine. I speak the words of God. I do the work of God. As the Father is doing, now I am doing. As the Father was speaking, now I speak, Hebrews 1. God at many times and many ways has spoken to us through the prophets and our forefathers through the prophets. But in these last days, He speaks to us through His Son. Whom He has exalted above all things. Don't ever forget that Jesus was truly, is truly man. And is also truly God. In John 6, He does a miraculous thing in feeding a multitude of 5,000 men plus with just a small portion of food, and they gather up 12 baskets. Jesus says, gather up what it remains, that none should be wasted, that none should be lost. And the people look and wait for Jesus, and Jesus walks across the sea, teleports the, the disciples in the boat to Capernaum. And the people had come there because of the storm had blown boats and they went in these boats and found Jesus. Oh, dear, great, awesome teacher. When did you come here? How did you get here? Do not labor for the food that perishes, but labor for the bread that endures to eternal life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven, sent by my Father to give life. Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. The sustenance of your hope is me and my work on the cross. The reason you do not believe is because you have not been given to me by the Father. For no one can come to me unless the Father makes him come, draws him, creates in him a new heart that he is his. And no one can come if the Father does not give them to me. You do not believe because you are not of my Father and you have not been given to me. No one comes to me. Unless the Father brings him to me. And all that the Father give, they will come. And all that the Father, all who come, they will be saved. And all that are saved will never be lost. They will be raised to everlasting life. And so on and so on. And, 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 and in John 7, we see this continuation of this discussion. Six months later, then we're into John 8. He is the living water. He is the light of the world. He is... God. And that's where He brings it to this day. We've gone through verses 48 through 50. 50, well actually 48 through 57. We've already dealt with them, but we're going to recap them this morning from a practical point of view as applying this doctrine to you as a body. 
And then we're going to end it with Abraham. It's going to take a good portion of our time today dealing with Abraham. I'm going to have to read the 18th chapter of Genesis and maybe the 22nd chapter of Genesis and some other places in Hebrews chapter 11 and a whole bunch of stuff. So maybe I won't read it all, but we'll point to it and you can make notes. Please take notes when you hear the Word of God. Write things down as you want to remember them. It is a good practice and it is a godly practice to take notes when you hear teaching. 48, the Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you have a demon and that you're a Samaritan? Jesus answered them. We've gone through this two weeks prior, last weekend, the week before. I do not have a demon. You notice that? That's what Jesus says. I do not have a demon. Now see, if somebody calls us a charlatan, Somebody calls us a liar. Somebody calls us. This is the practical theology. This is the applied theology here. Somebody calls us a name. Somebody calls us a, calls us a, 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 you know, a, a scoundrel. We personally are offended. We're personally affronted. We're like, oh, who do you think you are? I'm not a scoundrel. I'm not a liar. Have you ever lied? And you're a liar. <laughs> you see? It's not that we should take offense at these things. We shouldn't take offense at Jesus did not take offense at all of the persecution that came his way, but when they said that he had a demon, he said, no, I do not have a demon. Now, Hollywood would have done a better job of expressing Jesus. Because he would have been like Iron Man. See you kids? He would have went, boo, and burned everybody. I don't have a demon. Rah! I mean, you know, oh, wow, he doesn't have a demon. He is the demon. I mean, yeah. been, and no matter what Jesus did... Unbelievers will still accuse him of being of the devil. No matter what people think of Christ, it doesn't change who he is. And as Peter tells us, Jesus did not return revile with revile, but entrusted himself to the one who judges rightly. Christ did not have to defend himself because the Father vindicated Christ. The Father gave Christ glory. And there's a lesson in that for us. Jesus rebukes the idea of him being demonic. But he accepts all the other slanderous slurs. He didn't say, don't you call me a Samaritan. Don't you tell me that I'm a traitor to my people. Don't you tell me that I'm not a Jew of all Jews. Isn't that what we... Don't tell me I'm not a Christian. Don't tell me that I'm not Baptist. Don't tell me that I'm not Reformed. Don't tell... Who cares about those things? It used, to very, it used to make me very upset in the beginning days when the closest people to you, when family, friends, and cohorts begin to call you a cult leader, begin to call you demonic, begin to call you, say that you have another gospel, and all you're doing is preaching Christ and hoping and praying that God would call His sheep home and that you would see life and you would see growth and you would see intimacy and you would see glory over and over again as we peer into the pages of Scripture and we see God face to face in reality through Jesus Christ. Everybody wants to see something miraculous. Beloved, look at the Bible. There is no greater miracle than you being able to understand what it is saying and to see Jesus. But he doesn't deal with the slander against his character. We were not born in sexual immorality. And what does he say? Well, which one of you accuses me of sin then? Bring it. If you have an accusation, bring it. That should be our attitude. Lovingly. Jesus didn't double down and stomp his feet and put his MMA uh, face on him. Bring it! No, I mean, accuse me of sin then. Bring the evidence. Samaritan, whatever, liar, whatever, whatever, whatever. I teach the truth because I speak the words of God. You say he's your God, but you're a liar. <laughs> you know, that's what Jesus tells them twice to their face that they're liars because they don't know the Father. Jesus responds with this fact. How does he respond to this? How does he argue against these accusations? I honor my Father. Do we honor our Father who is in heaven? Not perfectly, not completely, not every day, but we do if we are in Christ. We honor God. When we are proclaiming the gospel of grace and sovereign grace, we honor the Father. We, as Jesus did, who spoke the truth of the Father, honored the Father. When he took the suffering, he honored the Father. When he testified to the witness of the Father, 
He honored the Father. When he revealed the work of the Father, he honored the Father. He never took honor and glory for himself because it belonged to God the Father and God the Father would bestow the glory that belonged to Christ to him. And when we honor God, when we speak of the truth of the gospel, we honor God. We honor our Father. We honor our Father when we correct error. We honor our Father when we call out sin. We honor our Father, but we dishonor our Father when we think we're better than those we're calling. And see, that's the accusation that under, under, undercurrently, that's not really, the undercurrent of this accusation is that you're a Samaritan, you have a demon, etc. Jesus responds with that. By, by, by saying, I do not seek my own glory. I don't seek my own glory. I'm not here to puff myself up. I'm not here before you so that these people will follow me instead of you. I'm here to save my sheep and the Father will give them to me and you can't stop it. You will not take any of my sheep from me. You see that? There's hope in that, beloved. The cults, the false teachers, all of these people who God ordains to continue to, barrage, to bring a barrage of evil into our culture, only those who are born of God can see the truth and believe. People will malign us, friends. People will destroy us. People will talk of us. People will do things against us and love us in the front and stab us in the back as they embrace us. And it is not going to stop. It is not going to change. And as a matter of fact, if we see the narrative of history in Christendom, it gets worse and worse and worse. God has never purposed, hear this, God has never purposed that America would be a nation of Christians. God has purposed that America would, as all countries, be Babylon. And he will destroy it one day. Either in his coming or either in its expiring I'm not saying that as citizens we don't strive to do what is best for us. But we cannot put our hope in what we will be as a, as a nation. We must put our hope in who we are as a nation of priests. People hurt our feelings. They hurt my feelings. Believe it or not, I have feelings. I have deep feelings. And I get hurt easily when people accuse me of things that I have not done. It is the number one sin in my life. That if some of you frowned while I'm preaching, I may think, oh no, what did I say wrong? Even if I read the text from the scripture, I must have misspoken. That's a paranoia of sinful proportions. And by the mercy of God, those are fleeting very quickly. Oh, well, that's silly. Moving right along. But there are some things that we've experienced as a church, people who have hurt us, people who have abandoned us, people who have done things and continually do things against us for years. And we're thinking, when will this stop? It's not going to stop. It's okay. And what's amazing is it's not gotten lesser, but we don't see it because we're not looking for it anymore. If you want to find dirt, you can find dirt. If you want to find bed bugs, just go to a hotel. If you want to see things to cause you grief, just open your eyes and peek into the, uh, peek into the soul of, of this culture. You can see it. If you want to be belabored over the grief of your faith and how people don't love you anymore, then just focus on those things. But Paul says to put our minds on Christ. Paul says to put our mind on that which is eternal. To look at how Christ lived and have a hope in that. That if God Himself and His humanity was hated... Should we not also be not surprised? There's too many negatives there. We should not be surprised when we are also hated. As a matter of fact, it, it teaches us that in just a couple of verses. We are in good company when we are maligned. Now here's the tragedy. It's one thing to see the cults malign us. It's one thing to see unbelievers malign us. But it's another thing when so-called people of faith begin to malign us. The so-called people who had the only people who held the oracles of Christ were the Jews. And they maligned the very author of the oracles. And I find it very ironic. I won't preach this because it's just, a, it's just an irony. 
He is the cornerstone. He is the rock of salvation. And they picked up rocks to kill him. <laughs> I just, I, I laughed out loud last night when I, that sort of popped into my head. Well, that's like a children's object lesson. <laughs> Jesus is the rock, and they picked up rocks. How dumb. How judicially blind. Jesus is dishonored a lot. He says, you dishonor me. They dishonored him because they would not what? They would not accept his testimony, which was the Father's testimony. They dishonored Jesus. Now, let me put this into an application of our culture. Dishonoring Jesus in this context, and then for us in this transcendent principle, is when we call Jesus who he is not. When we create in our mind, our language, our culture, or our vernacular, maybe that's redundant, a Jesus that the scripture does not testify to. For example, I'll give you some absurd examples. The Jesus of, let me start from the easy. The Jesus of the cults. Okay? The Jesus of the witnesses. He's just a created being. He's this, that, and the other. Jesus of LDS. He's just a brother. Is it like brother to Lucifer? He was an angel, and then they went their separate ways, and now they're at war with things. And they get that from the New Testament somehow. Well, I'll tell you how they get it, because they have another prophet that now has spoken for God and created a New Testament. All of them. Islam. What we call world religions, it's a cult. It's not a world. Just because it's old doesn't mean that it's not a cult. They are required to study the New Testament, for they cannot deny that Jesus was a prophet of God, just like Nicodemus. We know that you are from God. Well, the only prophet that was yet to come is Messiah. But they wouldn't want him because his Messiah actions didn't fill their earthly intentions. And thus, it was a spiritual problem because their glory would be reduced if Jesus didn't rescue them from Rome so that they could continue to be high and mighty. So dishonoring Jesus is to teach the false Christ of the cults. Dishonoring Jesus is to teach the false Christ of universalism. Well, God loves everybody. God's going to save everybody. God's going to make an opportunity to save everybody, and everything's going to be okay. I mean, you see that in, in, in some aspects of judgment and how people look at judgment. Like, I'll say the name, uh, like C.S. Lewis, who wrote extensively about the fact that the Old Testament was not authentic and who wrote extensively about the fact that there was no judgment of God against any human being, but that eventually God would put all people into righteousness. And that's one of many problems. Narnia is cool stories. He wasn't a theologian. He's a philosopher. And enjoy his philosophy, if you can stomach it. Should you read him? I like to read fiction sometimes. As long as it's not seen as truth. The false Christ of universalism, the false Christ of, and we've talked about this throughout this teaching of John 6, 7, and 8, of what? Potential redemption. You've heard me say for years that Christ is not a possible Savior. He's a perfect Savior. He actually paid for the sins of His people. It is a done deal. John 6 explicitly teaches this truth. Romans teaches this truth. Galatians teaches this truth. All of the Scripture teaches this truth. This is not a theory. Atonement in itself is a theory to most popular theologians. A theory, a possibility that we can infer from our astute reason and logic from the reality of the cross. We can infer it, a lot of people, as a viable theory. No, the atonement is an explicit doctrine of Scripture that Jesus paid for sins. They are paid for. It is finished. Jesus didn't say, it's just begun. He didn't say, the doors are open. He didn't say, listen for my knocking. <laughs> you know, Revelation, Revelation 3. By the work of John, by the teaching of Jesus in John 6, Jesus doesn't knock on the door of an unregenerate person and wait for him to open it. He kicks it down and says, I pay for your sins. And he snatches him into light. It's like a SWAT team. 
not a beggar. The false Christ of potential redemption, the false Christ of universalism, the false Christ of, of all sorts of different types of theological things that make an emphasis on signs and wonders and wealth and all this other type of stuff. Experiential, existential, everything that you can think of. There's a Christ to fit every desire of the flesh of men. They are false Christ. They dishonor Christ. They're not believers in this sense. These were not believers. People have argued with me this week that these were believers in John 8 because the Bible says they believed. Many believed. And Jesus, the narrative says, then Jesus turned to those who believed and said, you're lost. <laughs> you see. These aren't believers who need correcting. These are unregenerate people proclaiming a false Christ. Here's one for you. The false Christ of libertarianism. That's the title or the label, rather, that I have placed on decisional regeneration. This idea of the freedom of the will effectual in salvation. Effectual. The false Christ of legalism. The false Christ of antinomianism. See, we invent everything under the sun to satisfy our desires of how Christ should save us. And we add to the gospel. And according to Paul... Adding to the gospel is no gospel, but is condemnation. Jesus says in John 3 that God loved the world this way, that he gave his only son, the only one that he had, that whoever is the believing ones in him does not perish, but has eternal life. But have, whoever is not the believing ones are condemned already, for they are not the believing ones of Christ. They are not believing. For this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Friends, the lust of the flesh, of course, obvious, but self-righteousness is also evil. And this is all recap. This is 74 weeks of recap, by the way, if you haven't figured that out. It's going to ramp up here when Jesus starts healing this blind man out the doors of the next verse of chapter 1 of, chap of verse 1 of chapter 9. Yeah, we're starting back over. Chapter 1. But they dishonor Jesus, a false Jesus, a false Jesus of evangelicalism. Now, I've been saying, I've been using these terms for what? Seven months, eight months. The evangelical cult. And some of you just sort of take it. You go, oh, that's cool. And some of you have come to me and go, what in the world are you talking about? And other people have said, why are you talking about us? Not in here, but I mean without. Are you a cult? Are you an evangelical cult? I mean, can we say Christian cult? Yes, we can say Christian cult. A cult that is centered on the teachings of Christianity or the teachings of Scripture. It doesn't mean that they're truly Christ's people. They're not Christ's people. They have extra-biblical, hyper-biblical, outside of or above and beyond biblical understanding or revelation and then they what then they come to a place of of uh creating in themselves their own way to god the evangel evangelical cults of our day are nothing but just a step away from judaism which is really just in the intermediate there is what rome what does it look like when we continue to add to the gospel to such a way that we forsake the truth of God and think we're honoring God and then we're in doing so dishonoring Christ and by dishonoring Christ we dishonor God because no one comes to the Father except through Christ. And people will accuse us just like they accused what? Just like they accused Jesus of seeking his own glory. You think you're better than Abraham? Has he been asked that already? You think you're better than Jacob, our father, who gave us this well, John 4? Who do you think you are, John 6 and 7? What sign do you bring? What proof do you have? He gives them proof today. When he closes this text out and he says, I am, it's all the proof they needed. 
I do not seek my own glory, verse 50. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. As we saw last week, Jesus did not seek his own glory. Though it was due him, it would come through the Father. Jesus did not revile, as I quoted First Peter earlier, but entrusted himself to the faithful judge. We then also must do the same, beloved. We must entrust ourselves to the Father. We cannot assert our rightness. When we're sharing the faith and we're teaching the truth, we cannot be offended when someone doesn't see what we see. We cannot have an arrogance about us that we are smarter or better or more, uh, or more astute. We can grab all this information and use it to our advantage and, and then work with it. And voila, we see Jesus. We must be humble. We must be broken. We must have a spirit and a burden that weeps over the lost, that weeps over the reprobate, that weeps over those who will not believe, that weeps over those who are objects of wrath. We must have that heart, but we do not lose hope. You see, that's the complete, that's the cycle of Paul's life. I'm going to take the gospel. He had great expectation that God would save his people and people would come to faith. And then a majority of people after they left the city would devour the small body of Christ and try to bring all sorts of heresies. Like Paul says, there are heresies among you. There must be. Actually, there's an imperative there. Heresies among you. There will always be goats in with the sheep. There will always be wolves being birthed and maturing and one day they will snarl and snap and we will see them for who they are but they will not overcome us. We must do the same. We cannot assert our rightness because when we do what we do is we usurp the glory of God. We make people into a place where they want to fight us rather than stand and bask in the glory of God. Think of the tempest at Sinai. Think of what Paul says to the Hebrews in that letter. You have not come to this mountain. This mountain where the tempest and the lightning and the thunder and the voice of God and the smoke, the fear of God was in the people and they did not want to hear or be connected in any way to the voice that came down from the heavens. So much so that they said, let us never hear another command that is so Harsh, because God is so set apart, He's so perfect, He's so right, He's so magnificent that if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. I said, let us not hear it, not, let us not look at it anymore. We don't want to see your face, Moses. Cover your face. Because you've got this glow about you, because you've appeared at the shadow of the tail end of the robe of the backside of God's glory and you're shining. And we don't want to see this anymore. We can't stomach this anymore. I don't want to see it. And when God brought the law down and He says, this is what I expect. This is the display of my righteousness. This is the, this is the cause of my vengeance. You are not law keepers. You have not come to that mountain, beloved. You have not come to that mountain. You have come to Christ. In whom there is no condemnation. In whom there is no fear. Because He loves us and gave Himself for us. He satisfied God's wrath on our behalf. And His perfect obedience is ours to claim. So when we seek to be right, we take away that glory. We cannot seek to be seen as glorious. Even in the truth and how glorious it is, we must decrease that we exalt and increase Christ. So we do not need to take personal, yet again I say this, at the attacks and the persecution. We cannot feel harmed by the fact that people do not love us. The Father is the judge, and as the Father judged rightly with the Son and glorified Him, we who are in Christ do not seek approval of the world or the religious of the world, but we seek the glory of God above all things. When Paul says to the Corinthians that this is foolish, 
he meant it. He wasn't speaking metaphorically. He wasn't using imaginative language to color some sense of self-deprecation. Paul was not self-deprecating. Paul saw the glory of God. The world and the religious of the world, the unregenerate of the world, the lost of the world, until they are born again, will not love us. And our actions and words cannot please and appease unregenerate people. Those people who have been part of our lives for a long time and then they come to start to fight with us about the gospel or, or push away from us because we share the glory of God in salvation. It is not us that they are pushing away, it is Christ. And we can either rest in His glory and the sufficiency of this person, of His grace and His persecution, or we can yield to our flesh. What shall it be, beloved? The Spirit of God who is in us empowers us and preserves us and keeps us. We cannot mold ourselves after the liking of other people's faith or other people's truth because it is wrong and it dishonors Christ. It is disastrous to have double speak when it comes to the gospel. Christ gained glory from the Father and because we are in Christ, we too will what? Share in His glory. We must be clear about our idols. No matter who they are. No matter what doctrine it may be. And we must move them to the side that God may be seen in all of His fullness. Christ alone. These are not phrases that we've just adopted throughout history. These are words that have meaning. Oftentimes we lose the meaning of these words because we lose sight of the glory of God through the gospel, through the word. And that this, as Paul would boast, light momentary affliction prepares us for what? An eternal weight of glory. The heaviness of the eternal glory of Christ that will smother us to such a joy that there is no comparison. We think this burden is heavy. It's nothing. It's like this invisible jacket that I'm wearing. It doesn't weigh anything. Get me some help. But the glory of God is heavier than all of the burdens of this life. He says in verse 51, Truly, truly, I say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never see death. The Jews said, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say they will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? We talked about this last week. Unregenerate people, false converts, false teachers, legalists, religious et al. They all seek their own glory in the name of giving glory to God. But in doing so, they reject Christ and His gospel as revealed in Scripture. And in doing that, they dishonor God. Jesus recapitulates that those who believe His testimony, His teaching, His word are saved from sin. They are saved from death. Now why would He say that in the midst of these conversations? Because there were multitudes listening. And there was hope there. As the spiritual leaders of this day were seen to be destroyed by the teachings of Jesus, being overshadowed by the Shekinah glory of God in the face of Christ, then all of a sudden there comes some hopelessness for those who follow our spiritual leaders. And Christ is showing His people that there is hope. Believe what I say. Trust in me. Eat of me. Believe in me. Come to me. You have life. You are saved from sin. You are saved from death. Jesus was not offering salvation to the Jews and they rejected it. Jesus was proclaiming himself as salvation and they could not see it. So their plea, their defense was demonic. You must be demonic because the prophets died, Abraham died. These people sought their own glory. As Jesus says in verse 54, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. If it is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say He's our God, but you do not know Him. You have not known Him. I know Him. 
And if I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you are liars. You are liars. But I do know him and I do keep his word. So many think they glorify God, yet they dishonor Christ. And thus, as I've already said a thousand times, they dishonor God. Christ is God the Son. Many think they know God, yet they do not know the Christ of Scripture. So in this, they do not know God because Christ is God. Many think they are connected to God. They have some intimacy with God through some type of uh, uh, meditation or some type of study or some type of this or that or some type of lineage or some type of relationship. That's why people flock by the thousands to see spiritual leaders, quote, 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 pronounce a blessing on them or give them a word from the Lord or whatever and they cry and they weep and they fall down they take pictures they touch the stage they try to find the napkin that these men have used so they can have some piece of his DNA sticking in their Bible and they can hope in the man friends we hope in the man who is Jesus these people think they're connected to God yet they hope in the faith of others they hope in the connection of others the lineage or the tradition of others and just like these Jews who hoped in the lineage of Abraham they could not be in God through Abraham some people confess that it is not Christ who saves but it is we who save ourselves by what Christ has done they will concede that there are good people in the world who God will favor. No matter what they believe about Christ, there are some people who claim to be in Christ who will concede that there are those who have never believed in Christ as the Scripture reveals. Never believed in the Gospel. Never believed that Christ suffered on the cross to die for the sins of His people. Never believe that Christ is the only way to God. And yet they will say, those people are good. Look at their lives. They must be in Christ. He is our God, the Jews would say. He is our God, just like Abraham is our father, God is our father. This is not true of most people who confess Christ, beloved. When someone tells you they believe in Christ, ask them who Christ is. Just very plainly, who is Christ? And they'll give you some answers and they'll say, now what has Christ done that you might have faith in Him? The answer should be very clearly, Christ obeyed and my sins were credited to Him. My guilt was put on Him and He died. God punished my sins in Christ. They are paid for. And Christ obeyed where I could not. And that's been credited to me. So I am a law keeper before the Father. That is what the Gospel teaches in a nutshell. And then they need to recognize that God raised Christ from the dead. And as Trey taught some time ago, a couple of months ago, that resurrection is tied to our justification in such a beautiful picture of assurance and the covenant of grace that God would save His people from their sins. See, the gospel is God will save His people alone for, from their sins. There's no other gospel. And that's what we've been learning for 74 weeks and 44 weeks in Romans. A false confession is not the truth, it's a lie. If I see in the newspaper that someone robbed a store or, or broke into a house and I decide I just want to confess to it and I walk into the court and I say, yeah, I'd rob that house. And there's no evidence that I did it, just my testimony. Oh, James Tippins confessed to this crime. Wow, I can't believe that. And then they start to look and they find a video and it's not me. Guess what that? That was not a confession, it was a lie. So to say we people believe in Christ and confess Christ, but it's not the Christ of Scripture, it's a lie. It's not a confession. It's not truth. And Jesus here in verse 56, this is our sermon, that was the introduction. Here we are. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day and he saw it and he was glad. So the Jews said, you're yet 50 and you've seen Abraham truly truly I say to you before Abraham was I am and they picked up stones to kill him because he said I am that is how God identifies himself throughout scripture I am. 
He is the great I am. Some people say, well, what in the world? How did Abraham rejoice? Because Abraham had died in the flesh, right? He'd been long dead. So he was with Christ. He was with Christ in the bosom of himself. Isn't that funny? The bosom of Abraham. It's, it's Abraham's presence that the Jews look forward to. Not Christ. Jesus got in the way and they're like, are you greater than Abraham? Our father, yes, I am. I am. <laughs> you see? I'm greater than Abraham. He rejoiced in me. And people think, well, what in the world? Well, Genesis 22, I can't read it all, but you know the story. God had told Abraham to what? To sacrifice Isaac. In chapter 18 of Genesis, uh, just bear with me. In fact, I, I want to read some of that. Chapter 18 of Genesis. It says there that God, the Lord, Jesus Christ, appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran to the door of his tent to meet them and he bowed himself to the earth and he says, O Lord, if I found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, etc. So they said, do as you have said. And then here... After they ate, the Lord promised that Sarah would have a son this time next year. And Sarah's listening. She's in there, wondering what's going on, and she's listening. And she laughs because she's old. Isaac's name means laughter because she laughed. She could not believe. That's why Ishmael was born. As a matter of fact, if you, if you remember well, this is right after the circumcision of Ishmael. Probably some days later because he's walking around. But, and Abraham as well. There's a joke in that. Thirteen years after God promised Abraham a son, Ishmael was born, and then Ishmael was circumcised as a picture of the covenant of Christ. And then the Lord shows up with Abraham and promises his old, elderly, decrepit wife a child. And she laughs. And then Isaac is born. And then chapter 22 of Genesis, God says, Take that son whom you love, whom I gave you, and kill him for me. Abraham saw the glory of God. Abraham had seen Christ before Isaac, before Isaac was born. And Abraham saw the work of Christ and the picture of Christ in Genesis 22 when he got up early the next morning and he went and he left his servants at the bottom of the mountain and he took the wood for the burnt offering and he took the knife and he took the ropes and he went up and he found the place where he would set up the tabernacle and set up the altar and he prepared the altar and he had his own son carry the wood for the burnt offering. <sighs> And Isaac asks, My father, where is the lamb for the offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Every time I read that, it just destroys my countenance. Why? Because it's Christ. And Abraham looks up and he sees in the thicket a ram. He puts the knife to his son's throat. He lays him on the wood. The torch is lit and the ropes are bound. And the angel stops him. And there's a ram in the thicket. And he calls this place the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Turn to Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he, called, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And as he went out, not knowing where he was going, 
By faith, he went to live in a land of promise as a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking, look at this, y'all. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, (coughs) from one man, and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of the heaven and as many as the innumerable innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, (laughs) having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they have been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God as he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in fact of offering up his only was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. When God says your offspring shall be named through the son that he's about to tell you to kill, what hope do you have? Paul tells us what Abraham believed. He considered that God was able even to raise Isaac from the dead from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. (laughs) So, Abraham saw Christ and rejoiced in his day, for he longed for it from the very beginning. And for those Jews not to understand that, and for people to say, yeah, see, that's Judaism. (laughs) Wrong! Never was about Judaism. It never was about human covenant keeping. It's about God's covenant keeping. Abraham believed Christ long before he ever knew the reality of what Christ would be doing. He knew that God would send the Lamb. He knew. This is the spirit of Abraham. It is not the spirit of these people talking to Jesus. The spirit of these people talking to Jesus is starkly antithetical. It's different. It's completely removed from the spirit of Abraham in so far that they not only do not see Christ and rejoice, they hate Him and want Him to die. Such is the majority of professing Christians of our culture, beloved. We need the evangel clear in our mouths because the spirit of the Pharisees in our day is as clear as anything. I've never met an unconverted person who claimed to be in Christ that wasn't absolutely explicit on how they know they have eternal life. They have every answer in the book. Well, I prayed to receive Christ. I accepted it in my heart. I walked down the aisle. I chose God. I chose life. I did this. I did that. I did this or the other. And I remember in 2008 when I talked about testimony one time (laughs) at our church in California. And I remember saying it sort of like this. The first time I ever said it. I said, if your testimony, if someone were to ask you, how do you know that you have eternal life? And your answer starts, because I there's a very good probability that you don't know what you're about to say is heresy. Now, I could say because I have faith, because of what Christ has done, yes, but that's typically not what comes out of their mouths. It's usually because we are the children of Abraham. My daddy was a deacon. I've been in church. I was baptized when I was 12. I received Christ and rededicated my life when I was 20. I was saved under Billy Graham. I was saved under this. I was saved under that. I I was this. I was that. There is no hope in those things. And these are not egregious means to the same end. These are terrible demonic things that the devil has used since the 19th century, since the first century, since the first humans 
to thwart the teaching of Christ. The spirit of grace fights against the spirit of flesh. The spirit of we've been learning that on Wednesday nights. The spirit of God within us, the new man and the new mind, fights against the flesh. We've learned what that looks like. And we've learned that our battle is not ours to win, but it is Christ who is already victorious. The children of God rejoice in the teaching of His Word. The children of God rejoice in the intimacy of His people. The children of God long for the unity of the faith, and nothing will shake us. Yes, we may stumble, we may fall, we may stub our toes and dance around like an idiot, but we will not fall away. Those are metaphors to spiritual slipping. Weak faith, sin, temptation, despair. The children of God are taught by the Spirit of God. We've already seen this in John. They know His voice. We'll see in a couple of chapters. They hear it. They listen. They follow. They come out. They are drawn by the Holy Spirit. They are given to Christ by the Father. They come and they want to eat what the Father has shown us through the teaching of Jesus the Son, the living Word of God. We desire to know more of Christ from His Word together as Christ's people. We know that we are the children of God because we've been given to the Son. We know we have the Spirit because He testifies to us that we are in the faith. That we believe in Christ alone completely. Nothing else. Not and but. Not yell but. But Christ alone. Faith is the evidence of this truth. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. Abraham was counted righteous because he believed God. Because Christ would be the Lamb who would be His righteousness. And Abraham never saw it in his life. Oh, but he looks upon it today. He looks upon it today. And beloved, you and I look upon it today as we hear these words. We look upon that which Abraham longed for. We can see it. You have been given spiritual life through the gospel of grace sovereignly. This is rejoicing. This is means and calls and an occasion for rejoicing. This is amazing. Believing on the true Christ is the spirit of adoption. We cry and call Him Daddy. Not majestic Father, oh God. I mean, you know, yes, those are good too, but we have intimacy to call Him Papa. Jesus is better than Abraham because Abraham longed for Him. Jesus is better than Moses because Moses wrote of Him. Jesus is better than Jacob because Jacob could not provide water that came and welled up to life. Jesus is better than Joshua because He has given victory over sin. Jesus is better than Aaron because the bread of Aaron perished. Jesus is better because Jesus is the point of it all. The grace of God in Christ. He is the Lord. He is the God of heaven. And He has saved His people from their sins. And the Pharisees did not belong to Him in this manner. They were not His. But by the sovereignty of God, Jesus was murdered by the Pharisees so that He would pay for the sins of His people. In the unbelief of the Pharisees, the will of the Father for propitiation came to fruition. Without the work of God the Spirit to make alive the religious, they will not believe. And then they will always hate the truth of the gospel of grace. Have you noticed that, beloved? Just as the Pharisees in verse 59 picked up stones to throw, what does Jesus do? He hid himself from them. Many people pick up stones to throw at the gospel. Jesus has hidden themselves, hidden himself from them. He left them. He did not convert them. The lost who hate Jesus are not promised eternal life. They're not promised a 
opportunity for eternal life. They're not promised the possibility of eternal life. Only those who are His are promised eternal life. Only those for whom He has died are promised eternal life. We live in a day where the true gospel is so hidden when it is proclaimed, the stones come out. And as Jesus left them to their unbelief, this is going to sound harsh, but we have to do it in tears. We should do the same. We cannot cause people to believe. And as long as they want to talk and listen, and, but when they begin to hit us with rocks, just step aside. And maybe the Lord will convert them. Maybe they are the elect. Maybe they are the ones for whom Christ died. And they will come and one day say, I see. And God will rejoice and we will rejoice in God and Christ and God's people will rejoice and we will be forever together as siblings. But here's what we should take away from that, beloved. Not, oh, Lord leaves these people in their unbelief. He did not leave us in our unbelief. That's what we take away from this. It's not despairing, though it's burdensome. It's awesome. He should have, but he couldn't because our sins are paid for. So he must bring us to life. This is because God does not lie. And God does not change. And God will never, ever cast us out. Jesus did not walk away from us even when we were obstinate. Even when we were ridiculously arguing. This isn't true. This isn't what I've heard. The Holy Spirit of God went, wake up! And y'all did. <laughs> so did I. And we saw we can rest in that. I tell you the truth, beloved, you will not see death. You will not die in your sins if you hear my words. Jesus said He was God and that's why they wanted Him to die. Because He claimed once again to be not just equal with God, but in essence, God. And God, Jesus, has established your redemption through His work. And there is nothing that can take you away. Let's pray. Father, please. Lord, we pray that you would help our children to see this truth. God, we pray for our neighbors to hear this truth. We pray for our enemies to hear this truth. We pray for our families to hear this truth. God, please open their eyes, open their hearts, bring them to life. But Lord, your will be done. For not all are yours. Not all will come. Not all will be saved. So in that truth, Lord, help us to have comfort. Help us to be consoled by your Spirit. To let us put our eyes on that which is eternal. The purposes of your purposes in redemption. And your command and call and empowerment to proclaim this gospel to this world. And Lord, it doesn't get any easier as we continue in this text. <laughs> We're going to have more and more confrontation with not just our own thoughts and theologies as we clarify them by your Spirit, but Lord, with the world around us who will begin to wrap, up, wrap us up, Lord, in a label of heresy, of strange... Lord, we do not ask you to give us favor with men, favor with religion, favor with culture or tradition. We ask you, Lord, to keep our focus on the fact that we have favor with you because we are not condemned before you. Jesus took our sin and we have been made alive. And it is in his name we pray. Amen.